Hi folks, Happy New Year! Before we completely move on from 2025, I would like to talk about the publication from last year. First published online on the 13th of April 2025. Surely you've read the title of this video, so you should know what's coming. It's somewhat interesting yet relatively unpopular. By that I mean, it's relatively unknown by the general public. I mean, perhaps not even half of my audience knew about this publication. So yeah. That is my reason to talk about it. Surely not because of a certain video game. Yep, definitely unrelated. Anyway, let's move on to the topic. So, what was happening in this research? Well, spiders. You know spiders, right? I'm sure you've heard about spider. Spider is one of the most famous or infamous animal. Yet, there is barely any research on the genetic modification of spiders. Okay, pause. At this point, some of you might go, Ugh, why would you even want to do some genetic modifications of spiders anyway? What, are you gonna make an even creepier abomination? Well, good folks, fortunately, genetic modification in the real world is not making mutants or aberration like what you would see in thriller or science fiction movies. It's mostly little changes to the creatures that would benefit us. Um, I mean... To be fair, that's how it usually started in those kinds of movies. But, um, let's not worry too much, shall we? Back to the topic. The goal of this research itself was to be the pioneer of CRISPR-Cas9 gene editing for spiders. Because CRISPR-Cas9 gene editing had not been done to spiders yet. Oh, in case you didn't know anything about CRISPR-Cas9, I'm gonna explain it as simple as I can for this video. So, CRISPR is a repeating DNA sequences found in bacteria and archaea, while Cas9 is an enzyme associated with CRISPR to open up a strand of DNA. To put it very simply, think of it as a scissor to cut genome. There are basically two types of CRISPR-Cas9 gene editing, knockout or KO, and knock-in or KI. In KO experiment, two CRISPR-Cas9 are used to cut two specific parts of a genome, then removing the section between. You know, basically knocking it out, like Daruma Otoshi. That way, removing a specific function of the genome. Meanwhile, in knock-in experiment, you use a Cas9 sequence to cut a part of a genome, then inserting a DNA strand between it, right on the incision. You know, knocking your strand in. That way, inserting a specific function for the genome. Of course, the concept is quite simple, but in practice, it can be tricky especially if you are just starting, because you need to know the sequence of the genome and you need to design the sequence of the CRISPR-Cas9. Let me use a hopefully easy to understand analogy. You need to make a specific key to unlock the lock, but you need to know the lock first to make the key. And remember, genome sequences are practically unobservable by eye. You couldn't just use a microscope to see it, then use a microscopic scissors to cut it or something like that. That's not how it works. You inject a solution containing the CRISPR-Cas9 to a cell, then you let it do its own job. That's why it's not that simple. So, back to the research. What exactly were they doing for the research, and how? First, the object. They used Parasteatoda tepidariorum, which is the common house spider. Nothing fancy. You can find that species almost everywhere, in all continent. Well, maybe not the Antarctic if that counts as continent. So yes, the specimen itself is not a problem, nothing special. So, they anesthetized the female, injected the solution to their hemolymph, hemolymph is basically their blood by the way, then the hemolymph carried the solution to their ovaries, tackled the oocytes, that's the egg cells by the way, then they let it live in the lab, they let it reproduce, then the spiderlings will be mutants, literally. Well, that's if the experiment succeed at least. Keep in mind though, like I said earlier, this was apparently the first time CRISPR-Cas9 was used for spider, so they need to do some trials and errors, maybe a lot actually. Hence, for the first experiment, they wanted something easy to observe. And that was removing the eyes. Quite something, huh? To be precise, they wanted to try knocking out the sine oculus gene, aka SO, which is the gene that regulates eye development. The result was. Well, the offsprings have impaired eyes, some of them at least. You could also see the varying degrees of impairment. 
In the MT1 image, you could see that all of the eyes except the actual lens are gone. In the MT4 image, you could see that all of the eyes are completely gone, including the lens. In MT2 and 3, some of the eyes are gone. You could see that it's even asymmetrically reduced in the MT3 image. So yeah, you could say that the knockout experiment resulted in a success. At the very least, eyeless offsprings were produced. And so, they moved on to the trickier experiment, the knock-in. They wanted to modify the silk production. This one is the more relevant one. I mean, compared to making spider eyeless? Yeah, this one is definitely more relevant. Should be obvious, but just to add more explanation to why it's relevant, well, silks are material. There are several types of spider silk. The major ampullate, the one used as frame for their webs, actually have higher toughness and extensibility than Kevlar and carbon fibers. So, would be nice if we could use it in even more stuffs. At the very least, by messing around, we might discover something neat and useful. I know that might sound unconvincing, but honestly, that's how we discover a lot of stuffs. By messing around. Kinda. Anyway, to put it very simply, they knocked in monomeric red fluorescent protein, aka MRFP, into the major ampullate speedrain 2 gene. The result? Well, it should be obvious if you have read the title of this video, but yes, some of the offsprings produce red fluorescent silk. We could even observe it while it's still inside the gland, at least for the offsprings because their exoskeleton is still unpigmented. Oh, by the way, when the mutant spiders reproduce, the offsprings of those mutants are also mutants. Well, again, some of them at least. So yes. You could say they technically produce a lineage of red thread producing spiders. The red fluorescent itself is not exactly important for the research. It was just used so they could easily observe the change. But now, the question is, what's next for them? What are they doing now that they successfully created these mutants? Well, yeah, about that. The publication itself was retracted because the authors were unable to confirm that the knockout and knock-in occurred at the intended section. Remember, the goal was to establish a protocol for CRISPR-Cas9 gene editing in spiders. Unless it is consistently reproducible, it couldn't exactly be a protocol, isn't it? So who knows what will happen in the future? Maybe we'll get an update. Maybe a more refined methodology, or something completely different and groundbreaking. Oh, and Maybe some of you are asking, what happened to the mutant spiders? Well, honestly, I don't really know. Sometimes they are euthanized, but sometimes they are kept alive for further study. I couldn't find an answer to this question, so who knows. For now, let's just learn what is known. And that's all for now. Oh, by the way, I missed my old outro so much, man. I'm just gonna use this song again from now on. Hope nothing bad will happen. Anyway, enjoy your day.